Off the record. Is it okay? Yeah. Are you still recording? Yeah. Oh no, by all means. Okay. Yes. Um, so, the best uh, sort of thing we said earlier, um, hopefully black people, maybe black people need to go to be on their bounds in order to formulate some sort of... Zimbabwe. Yeah, they need to be down and out. I feel like we are. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, uh, because from what I said, it's almost like there's nothing that's going to be strong enough or hurt us enough for us to change our behavior, I'm slowly going towards that. Do you really think well, it's just about maybe a similar event happening and then you just like change up the world before? Or do you think maybe? <laughs> I know the answer, ma'am. I know the answer, ma'am. <laughs> Any collective, we are all collective. And I see that. Yeah. It's a big. Ah, I don't want to mind this answer. First? I'll I'll go first because I speak less than her. I'm, I'm so I'll, happy. I'll I'll tell you. So Sri, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka went bankrupt. Mm-hmm. They don't have fuel. People are public servants can't go to work. There's no money for them. Mm-hmm. President's house was crashed into or whatever their union buildings I think were. Mm-hmm. I just read recently that some of the ministers' homes have been burnt. Yeah. So we're not on our palms yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, South Africa can still go and Tulumashonisa for money. Yeah. Mm. Once we can't afford social grants, free medication, free schooling. Yeah. Then we will really burn. And then after that, then we'll have no choice because that's what's happening in Zim. I, I've got friends in Zim. Yeah. They're currently now finding real solutions. How yeah. do we take maize yes. and turn it into maize meal? How do we take our pigs and we don't have an abattoir, but how do we cut them up and make meat packets? Yes. Like they literally are forced to come up with their solutions or else they fuck. To provide for So we haven't, we're not on our bums yet. Yes. yes. Yeah. Once the social grants run out, then yeah. the riots were still mild the because they're still grants. You see the social grants. Once the grants, I'm telling you, 30, 30 million people are on grants in this country. Yeah. If they switch off grants tomorrow, Watch what will happen. Boy. Once government employees, the biggest staff riders in this country. The biggest one? Staff riders. Jesus. Staff riders. They are riding us. I mean, ESCOM workers had the nerve to, de- I'm sorry, I'm saying it. And I, you, yeah. Yeah. They had the nerve to demand more money when we were ah, so abused by ESCOM, right? I mean, city of Joburg has a nerve. Every, average ESCOM salary is over 700,000 oh, a year. Don't, don't, don't That's the average me. salary. Yeah, it's, not the, it's study, not the median. median. It, might, it might be lower for the workers. average person, but just when you look at but the numbers, on workers, average, even 700 and I think 40,000 yes. or 20,000 rand a year, even and the they want lo- more money. Even the lowest paid full-time employee at, 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 at ESCOM earns, earns, well. earns an average, which is way above the average workers in other the places. Sure. So, yes, of course, but I, I love the question because that's exactly it. Although in South Africa, and I really don't like to create that we're so special all the time, but we are because you need to understand it contextually. South Africa is not called a colonialism of a special kind for nothing, right? So within Africa, we are a diaspora. And I was having this conversation with somebody. We always say, oh, people in the diaspora, you know, when we describe our stakeholders, Tinege, who tend to delve in politics now and then, okay, no, I'm going to cater for the South African market and SADC and all the other blocks of Africa and, and the rest of Africa, and then the diaspora. But we're a diaspora. A diaspora is a place where the colonizer, basically, so I'm just practicalizing it, where, that, is, that is either we colonized people, so like the slave trade, took lots of Africans to Britain, to, you know, to Europe and America and the biggest populations of settled Jamaica and the islands around there and America mainly and then Britain. And then the, you call that a diaspora because you've taken them out of their indigenous environment and brought them into your environment where you then enslave them and own them and really just take charge of their lives and dehumanize them. But the same thing happened in South Africa compared to the rest of Africa, right? So yes, of course, there are white people, uh, the, the Portuguese, the French, the British, uh, the Dutch, and whoever else uh, colonized Africa, right? Um, but they didn't settle. So they would, they would establish what is called a colonial outpost, where there's a mining manager who can manage the extraction and make sure that there's a port establishment in order to, to get the stuff out. So Gitsina, they just decided, no, 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 this is beautiful. Anyway, so that's... We want to stay. It is the most beautiful spot in, 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 in the world, actually. We have the widest uh, diversity in biodiversity. Just plants alone, we've got more than 8,000 species of medicinal plants. 
species. So in each species, there's how many types, yeah? So I'm, 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 I'm loving your question because it, you need to look at it from that point of view, right? We've been through so many revolutions in South Africa. Currently, we are in a revolution. A revolution is not just about arms. It's something that drastically changes society, puts it into a shock, and really causes a depression. And that is probably why what Penuel is saying is so true, that chances of us actually reaching the Sri Lanka situation sure. in the extreme sense that now there's no more money to pay our staff riders or nothing um, ah, a little bit slim of course right why because we are so used to we're a diaspora in Africa we, we, we've got I mean if you can speak to your grandparents and your oh, my father's almost 100 years old so he's a grandparent to many people and if you if you understand South African history in a practical way not from what you read in the books and you look at what has happened to us from let's say 16 52 because that's the date we all love to today and you understand almost every 50 year cycle if not 30 year cycle in south africa there was a massive upheaval whoa this and that right fighting amongst each other so we, we we're very addicted to the cycle and it's not normal we need to get out of it but it does give us an edge because we i mean i think south africa is the only country in the world where something massive happens like the looting last year or even the, the unfortunate floods in KZN and people start making jokes like within an hour of seeing the headlines. And and I know I've seen it on Twitter, like people outside of South Africa, like in other continents don't get it. They're like, why are South Africans, you know, ANC people steal like billions of rands monthly from us, like billions. Like, they make me, and and we make the, memes. We make memes like serious stuff that's destroying our lives maybe that's our coping mechanism it is a coping mechanism so, so for us in South Africa in that context Penuel, I think we are on our bumps because you know Tina, we're not used to being uncomfortable all the time I mean the apartheid government was in charge for 46 years we never gave them peace like never ever underestimate our power to constantly fight and to democratize mm. also, South Africans love democracy they love democracy. I mean, it's like this narrative that we are innately xenophobic. It's crap. It's absolute crap. The mines were built on migrant uh, labor, not from South Africa, only from the other countries around SADC. So we're very used to having, you know, to living amongst all the beacons. There's hardly any borders, in fact, here in SADC, to be honest. That's true. Walk in and uh, out the borders of are Scotland, almost non existent. Walk in and out Lesotho. of Mozambique, Lesotho, Botswana everywhere and we are accustomed to that and we're comfortable with it because that's how we traded with one another as different nations really without you know having the borders in the context that we are different nations with our own monarchies and rules and whatever but we are on our bums once again so so you don't think we're on our bums you do no 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 he was just saying i think Peño was just describing what really being on your bums so, is so, 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 so then can we can we sense that here Maybe there's a different on definition for on your bum, depending on... No, not really, it's context. What Umandisa is saying yeah. is she feels we are currently in a shift because we are on our bums. So bartering will happen. There will be innovation because we are on our bums. But I'm also saying... I'm that saying we're not on our bums, bums. Yes, That's why, like like what that. you're asking... Yes, you're, you're saying you're not, you don't see change happening because uh, yeah. we're on our bums, but nothing is changing. I'm saying for those people... There's a deeper level of power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but so, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's when those people are going to be forced with it. The shops have nothing. Yeah. I'm not getting a grant, but we have to eat. Yeah. Exactly. Now there's no fancy pottery yeah, yeah. and what. Now I have to grow food. Now we're going to yeah. eat food too, or potatoes for the yeah. day. Because that's all we have. Now we have to innovate and, and build our own yeah. thing. So, milling, so it forces us to go back to. So we, we're saying it's just a Peno has given an extreme example. Mm -hmm. And I was really just trying to contextualize that mm -hmm. for us in South Africa, because constantly fighting our government and being and challenging systems, we've been being democratic forever because even if we didn't have a democratic system the apartheid government knew that they they, they they couldn't rest i mean we were constantly doing the i mean if you grew up in the 80s uh, you would understand this what i'm saying i mean <laughs> we were called stone throwers right as kids because we couldn't do anything to the apartheid police when they would come into the townships and there was a state of emergency in 1980 I can't remember i was in primary school okay so then my parents shipped me off to boarding school to the catholic schools in the Bund 
even to Zimbabwe and KZN, but um, because they didn't want us, you know, exposed to. But you came, you came home on school holidays, and there was this hippo permanently parked in front of our yard, like literally. And so the only thing you could do is throw stones. <laughs> and so we used to like literally just throw stones when the older people are doing the rest of the stuff. And so everybody was basically either throw stone or you're burning something or you're, I don't know, you know. But the point is, during that time, for instance, we, we boycotted <coughs> supporting um, the, the, formal, the formal economy, the white economy. Mm -hmm. And we would go and buy from the Indian areas. I'm sure your parents tell you about that. I'm talking the 80s, not so long ago. We literally boycotted, I think it was like a year. Mm -hmm. it, 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 that's when Cosato, around the time Cosato was formed, right? Or leading up to it. And nobody bought from town. Uh, you've heard those horrific stories about... I'm fun, I'm you didn't fun, know about that? I didn't know about that. I'm, I'm, fun, I'm finding myself that. getting triggered by what you're saying about stone wow, throwing. You, you didn't know about that? Can, you, can, can I please just respond to you? you will, I just want to, I just want to say this quickly. The, the stone throwing thing, it's, it's triggering because you find ANC leaders today calling people that were doing all of that along with them, calling them hooligans and criminality and what what. It's very upsetting. Very upsetting. So, so Mandisa was throwing stones. Then no Mandisa gets into government, and then people are unhappy with her leadership, and they throw stones or they boo her when she comes. And then she's like, "No, there's hooligans and criminality." And it's like, "How dare you? How dare you be the person to say exactly? You know exactly why they're doing that. They're rebelling against rubbish the way you did." They're doing what yeah, you yeah. did to you because you're rubbish. Yeah. And you're saying, instead of being like, I think the people are unhappy. Instead of saying that, which is true, <laughs> and they are you're saying, no, it's hooligans <laughs> and it's criminal elements. Yes. Nah, fuck and, you. And there's a third force. There's a fucking... Well, we are Sorry, force. you wanted to answer him. <laughs> no, 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 Benisha, Jay, I, I'm done. I was, just, I, I was just shocked that he doesn't know that there was a year, 1983, schools were shut down. Yeah. 1984. Oh, no, you'll find lots of kids were born in 1984 because 1983, all the township schools were shut down. So also differentiate if you were in the bunch of stands. It's funny you what you're saying. If you're in the bunch of stands, you're saying a lot of people were born in 1984 because kids weren't going to school. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I take that back. Jeez. Look at the stats. Look at the people born around the time. But 1983, the the the, the mass uh, mobilization against apartheid was picking up, and uh, all schools were shut down in the townships. Um, my father had intel on it in 1982, and that's when he took us out. That's because I went to boarding school in 1983. <laughs> I'm lying, actually, 1984. 1984, I went to my first boarding school. But yeah, that's that's basically it was a consumer boycott. So because obviously you need the consumer power in order to sustain all these FMCG and other great goods and all of that um, sectors. And so that's when I think also the, the, the like Linasia, um, all the Indian areas that already had a lot of, uh, you know, a, a supplementary or complementary economic organized economy. Um, you know, started booming even more mm -hmm. because we then bought from, we then yes. bought from, uh, because the Indians also had, uh, the Indian population also had their own organizations that were working together with everybody, you know, the Nana Lines movement, uh, the anti-apartheid movement. And um, that's when it boomed, like, and that's when the fashion of going to Indian doctors mm -hmm. and just consuming as much from Indians as possible mm -hmm. started because we then only bought from, from the uh, Ama Plaza, and all the Indian areas and schools were shut down in the townships. I don't know what was happening in the Bantu stands. I don't think the Bantu stands were part of it because of course they were a proper nanny state to the apartheid state. And so um, I can't remember why I was saying this. I think you are walking you are walking history history book. A yeah. walking but library. It's not history. I remember when we did when we had our interview with DJ Sbu, which I think is still the second, third most watched. Insane. It's because so many people are fascinated by things that you were saying that they'd never heard of, that they didn't no, okay. know. So and you know why that bothers me? Because that's also connecting dots, so like, yeah. that then explains in my mind why Lens is the way it is, why is the way it is, what's the way it is, why it is, why it is, the way it is, why 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 it is, to it is, why it is, why it is, <laughs> it is in white, you know what I mean? Sure. From our side, so part of it was. But then, of course, no. But then, of course.
course, the black, the, 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 the black townships also experienced a boom. Yeah. They were, you know, your Maponyas. Every town, ta- every township in South Africa had a mini Maponya, right? So, I mean, from, from a week I mean, a family, I forget the other family who owned like the shopping centers, a lot of the shopping centers around there. So, that's when they also boomed, right? Those, those, there's, con- there's conspiracies around those black people, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to entertain you. No, I hear you, I hear you. I was just, I was just mentioning. negative about the black advancement generally when they're not benefiting from it. Sure. It's like corruption. We all hate corruption until we benefit from it. Of course. So, uh, but also that anti-black sentiment has got historical colonial context. It's important for us to tell those stories for two reasons. Number one, for accurate history. Yeah. And number two, because Killer Mike does this in America. Yes. Killer Mike talks about when blacks used to vote Republican and how they had their own economies. Yes. You know, yes. and it was only when the Democrats took over that all of a sudden the black businesses That's collapsed. That's exactly what happened in South so Africa. So black kids need to know. Speak about when pyramids. The ANC took over. Black kids need to know that we used to have black entrepreneurs, business. It's not a Real new ones. thing. We can do it. Shearwold. And we can do it again. Did you ever hear of Shearwold? Yes, I Shearwold was a black project. The, 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 it's a, I don't know if, I don't know, I, I just can't remember some of the names. I do think Maponya was one of the, was one of the, in the consortium that built Shearwold. I do think Dr. McLana. Shearwold was about that. Yes. So, we were still this, this Dr. Sam, no, Dr. Sam Mulope, who's apparently been who was apparently corrupt, not corrupted, looted by Cyril and some of his people. Um, huge bakery. I think when you look at the data, it's ridiculous. I think he had 8,000 employees, which is, who the fuck has 8,000 employees B-E-E. back then? B-E-E. And I don't know if Sasko Sam is, is named after him because he had a huge bakery. Mm, I, okay. Huge bakery. And then no, Cyril mean, came in and... and no, 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 it's, it's somewhere okay. here because... There's a story, you can check it on Google. Sam Malupe and, and the story of how oh, Cyril got involved up. and, and apparently one of the McDonald's Cyril distribution collapsed. sites is Cyril is a lot of black business people. But so Sam was running a proper enterprise and he's one story because it's a story that comes up with Cyril. But there's a lot of stories around the country. Oh, no, around Cyril it can't just be about Soweto and Watwa because the media was here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If people can go and dig. Every township. Because one of my favorite things to, to do, I've been doing it since I was in varsity, I visit these random towns and I try to find out who runs the town. Who's the Greek family that owns the spa and the shopping center? Who has the biggest tenders and who are they? Why, why them? Who has the bigger, who supplies the meat in this town? Yeah. You find it's always two, three, four, five yeah, families. Yeah. There's like one black political family. There's normally an Indian family that is undercover but runs a lot. Then there's normally like a Greek Portuguese who started off with a supermarket. Today they own, it's fascinating, but this stuff is not documented. Mm. And when you speak to them, unfortunately, a lot of them don't want their story told because it brings it's unnecessary, painful. It's not, painful. besides pain, it brings unnecessary uh, attention, attention and exposure. Yeah. Now all of a sudden people know you guys actually make 50 million a month. They're like, what the fuck? In a small little pub town, 50 million a month. And guys, you guys are driving a buggy. Brenda Fassi so. made how much money in the 80s when she, I mean, Brenda Fassi would sell out F&B. So, and that's unheard of. Like, unheard of. Big, even today. Now, even like, oh, today. So is selling filling out, out, yeah, selling out F&B is ridiculous. Yeah. Today. But you know what shocks me about what you're saying? I don't get why. This is contemporary history. So it isn't just a It's match. relatively now. Why are your parents not telling you this stuff? That's so, a so, question. So political conversations and social conversations and, you know, it, it speaks to why I keep insisting, we must, as black people, focus on our problems, analyzing them, understanding them, breaking them apart so that we can solve them. As black people, we've outsourced our lives to government or some big company. I don't know why we do that. We didn't grow up in an era where, where everything... I mean, where, if you worked at a mine and there were more jobs during apartheid, most people who worked at medical aid had um, pension fund, had paid UIF, and, you know, that was basics, had housing subsidies. Private companies were forced by law. The apartheid government forced them because the apartheid government were, were scientists and they understood that an economy must be managed and you must shift as much responsibilities to the people who are making profits versus the, the neoliberal thing that now is, is being followed. But the, the, the point is... You know, people, us who were born in the 70s and people, I suppose, older, um, don't, we can't relate to this. 
I, I can't relate to social grants. Outsourcing your thinking and your livelihood and your ex- entire existence. We cannot relate to You it. cannot exist without government. Your employer was your employer. It's just a place where you went to work. There wasn't this entitlement. At, you know, my weekends, I mean, I remember at some point my mother was selling sanitary pads to help because, you know, my dad will go and commit to things and then he doesn't pay. So often she's stuck with boarding fees and stuff. So we were selling sanitary towels. My mom was, she worked in retail, but she, she had a lot of customers and, she, you know, she, uh, that loved her. And she, there was this white lady who had a factory making pants and you know she said to her listen i know people in the townships are struggling now and there's this consumer boycotts and you know we can't move our products so can i give you unbranded pants and then we sell it obviously it's pants i mean we were selling pants like like those sanitary towels paid for our fees but i'm saying that every family almost were doing stuff on weekends after work. But we have seven zero, but we have a whole lot of pension fund for your old age and pay. But the government made you pay for everything, electricity, but then they would deliver quality service, right? There wasn't this, we have this heavy entitlement to somebody doing something for us. I can't relate to it, it's so foreign. Somebody must give me a job. Do you know how many, there's a, a guy who owns a string of buses now, a bank, who used to do my mother's garden. And he, I'm giving you examples, like, I mean, when my mother was, she says to me, oh, you're going to my bus, I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, and he used to, he used to basically, he started off, you know, with a lawnmower, actually not even a lawnmower, he's scared, so see which I um, you know, doing people's gardens. And that was very common. It wasn't, and no work was demeaning work. No work was Being demeaning. A domestic worker was the proudest thing. I had a grandmother in the Eastern Cape who was a domestic worker. She was some white woman, King William Sound, and obviously we'd go and visit there and get nice food and be in the white area for that time, of course. Um, like, especially if she was going on leave for a week. So she's like, oh, madam, and then we'd have to go. And we get dragged there because we can speak English. So it's like, at least love about <laughs> but the point I'm making is that work was 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 a value was a, an invaluable thing was 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 appreciated and was um, before you even discuss money there would even be flat rates in the townships for what you pay somebody who helps you in your garden mm. you couldn't negotiate to say okay mm. you charge us so much because of buying a city slab no. Work was work and everybody wanted to work because that's the trick. The trick is to be able to work. The value in what you earn from the work comes later based on your experience and the quality of work you do. Now it's the other way around. People are unemployed now. So can we talk about the work first? (laughs) And then we can come to the money because also I do need to start you off very low. I can't start you high. I don't know how you work. Mm. What if I start you high and I won't get the value? So yeah, we're stuck in entitlement and we don't well, realize. Right then, I feel like also, I mean, one of the reasons I'm just starting to think of why people are so um, like willing to get grants and stuff is that the, the message now has been we'll take care of you. I mean, that's been the almost narrative. Yeah, the free but stuff. Sure. The I don't think you guys were campaigning there. around freedom. Yeah, I don't think. I don't think people were fed that by the apartheid government. Sure. The apartheid government was about productivity. The problem with the apartheid government was the racial uh, abuse and you know all of that. But if you removed the racial aspect, of course, I mean, unemployment in South Africa in 1994 was how much? It was less than 10%? Yeah, 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 in 1994. So the problem is that, you know, we listened to thugs. <laughs> they, they, they had no idea. They had no idea how to run an economy. I heard there was a law. Are we still recording? No, I'm recording. Solid, <laughs> solid. Yes, solid. I heard there was a law called law for stuff, or like there was a bylaw or something like that. Like yeah. They find you just walking around. Listen, just loitering. Sure. Lo- loitering. Loitering. Should be illegal. But was illegal. Um, the people who would be found in the shop were understood to be gangsters. 
Like it wouldn't just be an average, it wouldn't be an average person. Not going to school as a crime. If you were found, because you must understand, majority thousands of the schools that are in the townships were built by the apartheid government after 1948. Yes, there were those built by the British system in different parts of the country. But when apartheid then officially came in in 1948, they started a massive construction a project, rail lines, hospitals, all the apartheid infrastructure you see, the houses in the, every township, the roads, all the, they used to build new roads into it. <coughs> Is there a new road into it? They expanded where they needed to. Sure. <laughs> but there's, there's no new infrastructure really. Yeah, here and there. Ah. King Shaga International Airport is new infrastructure. Uh, I don't know. The airport in Bumalang and Nalspreet is new, but it, it's privately built by um, ABB, yeah. uh, which is an American Swiss company. But uh, the point I'm making is that the apartheid government then had an economic plan. So politics is not about the social factors. It's about an economic program. That's politics. If you want to be in politics, you want to go and run government, you need to pre present an economic program to the citizens. Because as you've now learned the hard way, the last 28 years, what did they present to you? A social program. We'll give you free this. We'll give you free this. And then the number party. Everything was a party. Nakrova, 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 nakrova. Right? And that's all you know now. And then you wonder why this. Selling alcohol was very strictly monitored during apartheid. You couldn't, you couldn't be out of school and not be able to explain yourself. Literally, the police patrolled. Now I'm a police, I tell them a police station. And even when they get a call, they don't respond, right? Police patrolled. Magni, so what, what are you doing here? They'll put you in the van and keep you until your parents come back from work. Like, they know you're going to even like mess around with you. And then when your parents come back from work, release you. If they find you again, I know in worse instances, they would even come for your parents. So we keep finding this person. So it's, yeah, it's just lawlessness now. It's lawlessness. If, if, literally, and I'm telling you, if we took the program, the apartheid government, the economic program, the apartheid government, Penuel, as it is, of course, times and commodities and all of that have changed. But if we took the, the basis of the economic program and applied it now. If we were to just copy it. Just copy just it. Just build, build another ESCO, build another Sazon, build another ESCO, just, just another that. airline. Just be like, oh, they just, they just copy it across provinces, just as an example. By the way, those, just things, those things are still there. They still there. ESCO is where it was. Sazon, did you listen to a guy from, I, I can't remember his name, from a union called Giusa? Uh, the other day I was watching news and he was talking and he was explaining their proposal they, as a union because uh, I think they're organizing that space for what should happen with the fuel to protect us from these situations of war and when we can't get sure. certain products. But, I mean, you might criticize that or whatever, but Sasso, for instance, had a proposition because it was a state uh, um, initiative. Um, they had a proposition to, I think it was during the time of the transition, the Codesa negotiations and said, listen, okay, now that you smart guys are coming in, because with the apartheid government, obviously they're going to be out, and so you need to bring your guys in. And I explained to you about the infrastructure thing that my father used to be involved in talking to these thugs uh, when they were in exile, to explain to them how power generation works and how the economy is built through power generation and roads, because you can't have power lines without roads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you, so when you have power lines, so energy, you need energy to build an economy. There's no doubt. Like, and then you need roads, and then you need rail. Those are the basics. Those are the basics. Basics. Right? The like basics. The bare the basics. minimum, right? So um, Sassel then gave this proposition to these thugs and said, listen, we can produce all the energy from a fuel perspective for South Africa. We've got the science, we've got, like, I mean, you know, the, the apartheid government was all about science and research, whether it's medical science, any form, all forms of sciences. That's why you find all these old science institutions that the ANC has basically killed off, you know, are still in existence, even though they're in small. SABS, South African Bureau of Standards, CSIR, Medical Research Council, Agricultural Research Colleges, they've killed off a lot of that stuff. But anyway, they then presented this thing and said, listen, I mean, the government invested in this thing. And the whole idea was to keep petrol at a, at, a, at a standard price for South Africans, which is five rand a litre, for life on one condition. 
one obviously it would then employ hundreds of thousands of South Africans from production, the whole value chain. But give us Africa as a market. Speak to the rest of the you guys are now coming in. So obviously the other African governments are now going to be willing to listen to mm. a, a black government. So give us the cure Africa so that we produce energy for Africa. And of course, that would then subsidize the South African price because South Africans bearing the brunt of the environmental problems, et cetera, that comes from producing fuel would then benefit in the pricing. You're triggering me again, but I'll keep Guess what your friends did, and they'll deny it. They'll tell me, ah, I tell Mandisa to give evidence of those discussions. <laughs> we all know those discussions were secret, but I mean, everybody knows because people would come out of the conversations and talk. And of course, they rejected it because they had an agenda. I mean, the Rothschilds were funding these guys. Uh, when Abu Mbegi wanted to privatize ESCOM. I don't know Mbegi if you know. was funded by the Rothschild. <clears throat> Back when Mbegi was president. You can read it now. When you look at, when you read note shading on Wikipedia, Yeah. you'll find that Abu Mbegi were trying to privatize and sell ESCOM, but they were outvoted. And in that period, Kwaktiwa, guys, you have to maintain, you have to, but I, and like, yeah, during, we, still during, want, we still want to sell this thing. That's why he was uh, trying to collapse it by not maintaining, you see. That's what they did to ESCO. So the bottom line is, it's good what's happening now. I know it sounds wrong because people are experiencing the anguish, but it's good because politically and economically as black people and, and i keep saying it we need to understand that we need to take charge of rebuilding our country it's actually good because you must remember that once there's no more money in government mm -hmm. party political proportional representation and we have that conversation the people who are interested in in contesting uh, public uh, positions that are elected uh, are, are not going to want to. The minute, the, if they can finish, you know, the best thing that can happen to us is that they compl they've already bankrupted government, but they bankrupted to a point where even the IMF doesn't want to yeah, borrow. Yeah, we can't anymore. go to Marconi's anymore. The IMF and BRICS doesn't want to because you can't pay back, right? Sure. Then the salaries will go. Of course. And then the minute there's no money, if, if we do what China is doing, so if you want to be a public representative, you're not going to earn a salary because it's a public duty. We'll pay for your petrol and your meetings, you know, the stuff that's going to cost you, mm -hmm. yeah, right? To make sure that you do your work. Maybe you get some state vehicles or whatever for you to move around, a phone, a laptop, data, you know, the stuff mm -hmm. that you now have to pay for. All of that we'll take care of, right? Venues for meetings, etc. Mm -hmm. If If we can get to that point, that's when all the criminals that contest elections will stop contesting okay. because there won't be an incentive for them. And and citizens hopefully will will get off our behinds and I wanted to say this just in closing from my side. Yeah. Um, the apartheid government understood that to build a strong economy, the cost of production and getting things out there needs to be at the bare minimum. As low as possible. So when ESCOM was built, it People, it was, it was run at cost. So whatever you're paying for your electricity is just so that they can keep running. Today we have SOEs that chase profits, <laughs> which is like ridiculous. That's not meant to be the, let's say, let's use a stupid example like SAA. If SAA's mandate was we need to get as many South Africans as possible to travel around the country for e economic reasons, to travel around the continent, to go overseas. You have an idea, you want to pitch it to China, SAA is going to sell you a ticket at cost at so you even. can go there, so yeah. you can make us money. Yeah, at break even. They're not going to chase profits because that kills the whole thing. Like, I'm a landlord. I own a, a, a building. I need to have, as a primary objective, I need to keep you here yeah. for as long as possible, and I need to make sure that you're making money. If I kill you with rent... You're obviously going to be gone in two months. Now I have to look for a new tenant. Yeah. I'm never going to have tenants. So this whole, again, chasing profits is cool, especially for the country as a whole. But the cost of production, who is that's why you subsidize the farmers. That's yeah. why your electricity is almost nothing. That's why your fuel yeah. is meant to be almost nothing. You're meant to be like in that country. Exactly. You travel for free. You electricity so that you guys can like produce. Like in the Arabic countries, yeah. Then you can make as much money as you want because then they'll make it back in then the Then you can even pay high salaries. In the what, what, you can pay high salaries. You can pay, that's but why the, the if salaries. The, if listen. the cost, if you want to tell me, if I ask you why is your business struggling and you want to tell me about electricity, rent, fuel, 
you already fucked. Yeah. Which yeah. is why they tell kids, uh, when you're young, <laughs> start a business in your parents' garage. Exactly. Free rent, yeah. free food, free, free accommodation. Your you parents might give you transport. You can even borrow the car. <laughs> That's why your Apples, your Facebooks were built at Rares, and it's literally because of that. And anyone who understands that psychology of the cost of production must be as low as possible to maximize the output. The person that understands that will be successful. The one who doesn't and who's going to milk. But that's also a person who wants to build. Win. That's a person who wants, who to, wants build. to build. But a person who wants to steal. This guy was telling me in, in, <laughs> in Germany, I think it's the equivalent of 115 rand. I stand to be corrected. I think it's the equivalent of 115 rand. Use all the public transport in Germany. Not for free, but for that 115 rand. And he was comparing it to just a person taxing from Soweto to four ways in a month before you look at other costs of other travel. Listen, do you how are you then going to build an economy? Do you know how it? cheap state buses were? Like whether they were at least for like metro buses and all of that. Yeah. Trains. They killed, they killed our <laughs> railroad system so that they could become rich of trucks. Exactly. I mean, our, exactly. our rail was solid. It needed to be expanded. You needed to know yeah, that... We're not making a big deal out of that. Out of like the fact that we don't have a rail. Transportation for workers and also moving goods. Whether it's coal, whether it's whatever. Yeah. It's meant to be like, you know, to move... When I move produce, it cost me five rand to move... We killed that and we're like, we want to build an economy. We're fucking lying. That's why the guys have to go. And if they don't want to go... So the conversation with the gentleman I had today, it was... If government is not going to come to the party, we need to build parallel alternative units yeah. and be like, we're going to create the free or cheap whatever. The problem is we, things we, like we, legislated we need, we need, energy. No, no, no. We need, we need, but we if need. we can create our own energy, our own fuel, our own distribution systems that sidestep government, we can build a strong economy create, ourselves. No, we, we, Otherwise, we leave South no, Africa we, and go build somewhere else. We can recreate government because government is us. Remember, government relies on the tax system. The tax money comes from citizens, whether sure. they're corporate citizens. So we can recreate all those systems. And it's even easier now than ever before because there's so much technology that you can get off the internet, how to make this, how to make that, how to create this. And so that economy, that alternative economy, it's actually, it's actually poss possible now because you must understand that even though they continue to lie in the campaigning and all of that, we'll give you free this, we'll free that. The, the lived reality, even the, the, the a person with the least amount of creativity in their brain knows Utibana Manga. Because the lived reality is that Ayikuleobali. Why else would they be trying to charge us more for electricity, charge us, increase our rates and taxes? I wrote a letter to my body corporate when they sent me the increase from the city of Jobo. I said, I'm telling you now, we can go to court. I'm not going to pay the increase. Where must I get the money from? I don't mm -hmm. have it. The, if the rest of the property owners here want to accommodate this evil rates, increase in electricity and whatever else from the city of Joburg, so be it, maybe in any privilege you can, I'm not paying it. Mm -hmm. I'm actually not paying it. Every time I get my bill, thank you for sending me the letter saying, yeah, the increase, which is how much percent, I'm going to subtract it and I'm going to pay you the rest and we'll meet in court. I don't have it. Maybe other South Africans have it, but my economic analysis tells me very few people can afford these increases. I just don't have it. This is the time for us to, they must collapse the economy. The ANC must collapse the economy. I think it's the only time that we'll really start to talk to each other as human beings and sit down and say, listen, guys, get you a manch. Let's, you know, let's make, we're going to start with food, logically. I want to shut this conversation down. My my last my last my last point is this. Sorry, Pedro. No, it's no. I'm triggered by what you're saying. Um, yeah, but I'm sorry. I'm, I keep responding. So no, no, no. Don't worry about I'm that. Quiet now. Um, no, it's no. I'm only saying this because I said my last. I said my last was my last. No, no, no. But I'm also out of order. No, I'm Jeez. also out of order because you've been saying that and I've been interrupting. Sorry. One, one of the me. things I I did ask is <laughs> I wonder if Abu Abu Cyril and them are actually intentionally trying to collapse this country because if they collapse this country and they keep the IP and the infrastructure for your ESCOMs, SESOLs, ESCOs when the country collapses and then it needs to be rebuilt at cost or whatever, they're going to be the people that we go to for those things because they have the IP and the what yeah, they'll, they give, they'll keep ESCOM because they're privatizing ESCOM yeah. they've done these IPP deals which yeah. they've given to Patrice and about Jeff Khadebe. Yeah. They they're stripping away SAA they've gave, given it to 
So when the country collapses and all of us have no money and we have no, and everything is expensive, they're going to be the solution because none of it will be state owned anymore. So you'd be like, but we need a plane. And they'd be like, oh, we, we have a planes. plane. Yeah, we, we, we don't have electricity. Plane. And they're like, yeah, hey, the country's bad, guys, but we can provide electricity. <laughs> so there might be an agenda that they intentionally are trying to collapse the country. Because some of the solutions are really, you don't have to think hard. You're like, but guys, we know we need to. And they, they almost are like, no, turn it up more. Yeah. What, how much was the salary increase? 4%. Oh my goodness. Increase food by 10%. Increase fuel by 20 Increase the energy system. by debt. Petrol. They won't be able to afford. Yeah, but what about the debt shops? And the, yeah, they'll collapse. They won't be able to afford their debt. They, they want to go to their knees. They think they're desperate now for grants. Let's collapse the country so that even the middle <laughs> class is like, we want yeah. a universal basic income. Yeah. Please help us. And they won't be doing it as government because they'll pass that on to the next idiot. Yeah. And they'll come as the private sector, as the new Oppenheimers and be like, we really want to work with the new government hand in hand and provide the solutions. Yeah. You know, we can help you guys with your energy and your capitalist. I, I, I really, I really think there's a chance that that's what's happening. I'm done. Thank you.